Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Baker Institute. Um, I'm Ken Medlock. I'm the director of the Center for Energy Studies here. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy uh, on this occasion to uh, uh, welcome you all here, in particular in partnership with uh, uh, Baker Botts, who has helped us put this uh, incredible program together that you'll be able to enjoy today uh, as we discuss global uh, global transitions, particularly in the energy space. Um, there's transitions going, going everywhere, but um, I think uh, from the standpoint of this audience, what's happening in energy is, is certainly something that might keep us up at night occasionally. Um, uh, and trying to understand and decipher the innovations that are occurring uh, almost on a daily basis is, is, is incredibly valuable and very important. Um, but before we get started, uh, I want to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, there, you know, this is my safety moment. There are no fire drills planned for today, so if you hear any fire alarms going off, there are exits where you came in, but also behind me on either side. Um, facilities are also behind me on either side, men's on this side, women's on this side, if you're looking for them. Um, uh, and uh, in addition to my safety moment, the other housekeeping note is the way we're going to handle Q&A for the entirety of the day is through the question cards that are actually on your seats. Um, so if you have a question during the course of the presentations, please write it down and uh, somebody will be walking along the aisles, uh, picking those up and bringing them up to the session moderator so that those questions can be addressed. Um, so with that, I will uh, step aside and actually ask Stephen Miles uh, to say a few words. Stephen is a partner at Baker Botts and has actually been my partner in crime along this, uh, uh, along this journey to put this uh, conference together. Stephen. Thank you, Ken, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I am Steve Miles. I'm the chair of Baker Botts' firm-wide energy sector committee and uh, partner in our Washington, D.C. office. It's, it's been my pleasure uh, to work with Ken, Christine, the rest of the staff here, uh, and at Baker Botts uh, over the past year in developing what we really hope is going to be a thought-provoking and, uh, and uh, insightful program for everybody. Uh, like Ken and my fellow partners, we're thrilled that you all are here today. We're going to have a sold-out crowd and then some, um, and um, so we're very excited uh, and appreciative to all of our speakers for, for making it here today. Before we start, like Ken, I have a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first, as you all know, this event is being broadcast live uh, and can be accessible on the web via both the Baker Institute and the Baker Bots website. In addition, we have invited a number of members of the media with us today, and some of them will be here in person, and others will be watching through the, uh, through the webinar. Um, the logistics break out pretty easily. We have four panels today, uh, about five speakers on each, and so we'll have one break between panels one and two in the morning, that's uh, oil and power, and one break between the two panels in the afternoon, uh, gas and technology. Uh, we'll be uh, having lunch at noon outside uh, under the tent, and then at 1 p.m. we'll come back in here and Secretary uh, uh, James A. Baker III, who is our featured keynote speaker for the afternoon, will kick off our discussions then. I now have the privilege of introducing Ambassador Edward P. Derasian, the director of Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Ambassador Derasian has served his country in a variety of uh, continually impressive roles. His career in the U.S. Foreign Service spans the administrations of eight U.S. presidents, from John F. Kennedy to William J. Clinton. He's a leading expert in national security, foreign policy, and the complex interplay of political, security, economic, religious, and ethnic issues throughout the Middle East and South Asia. Ambassador Derasian has played key roles in the Arab-Israeli peace process and in resolving regional conflicts. Prior to his nomination as U.S. Ambassador to Israel, uh, he served both President George H.W. Bush and President Clinton as Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, and he served President Ronald Reagan and President Bush as U.S. Ambassador to the Syrian Arab Republic. In addition to his posting in Israel, the ambassador has served his country in Beirut, Casablanca, Jordan, Moscow, and a apparently particularly challenging assignment in Bordeaux. <laughs> he served in the United States Army as a first lieutenant in the Republic of Korea, 
Following his graduation from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree along with a Doctor of Humane Letters from Georgetown and a Doctor of Laws from Middlebury College. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor to introduce Ambassador Duration. Thank you, Steve, for that uh, generous introduction, which is much longer than my remarks, actually. Um, Steve mentioned Bordeaux, and I want you all to know that I gave my liver to our country. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy for what promises to be a day of timely and relevant discussions on key energy uh, issues. Uh, the expertise in this room is uh, overwhelming. Next year marks the 25th anniversary of Rice University's Baker Institute. We will be celebrating throughout the year with commemorative events highlighting our public policy research programs and having a gala in the fall of 2018. We have remained true to our original model of a nonpartisan think tank, building on our comparative advantage, our research programs based on data, objective data, and being an integral part of Rice University and the city of Houston. Our Center for Energy Studies under Ken Medlock is a prime example of our model, which draws on Houston as an energy capital of the world, the energy capital of the world. The Center for Energy Studies has proven to be among the world's top energy research institutes. This year ranking, this is rather remarkable, ranking second globally and the first in the United States as the best energy policy institute, one in the world and first in, in, in the United States. Uh, we're very proud uh, and, and the institute itself has been ranked as the fourth best university affiliated think tank in the world, preceded by the London School of Economics and two centers at Harvard. And that also is a bit remarkable when you think about the major think tanks being on the East Coast, the West Coast, and we're in the Gulf Coast. And uh, something we did was right in terms of our model and the tremendous support we've gotten from the Houston community uh, from all uh, levels. And of course, I've been very lucky to be able to recruit top scholars and uh, researchers uh, to really produce the intellectual work that has made the Bakers do what it is. Today, we are very proud to partner with Baker Botts for this uh, singular event. Our ties with uh, Baker Botts are very close uh, through both our honorary chair, Secretary James A. Baker III, and his grandfather, Captain Baker, who was instrumental in founding this great university. Baker Botts is one of the world's premier energy law firms and is we very well placed to speak to global developments in the energy industry. On that note, I'm very happy to introduce my friend, Andy Baker, managing partner of Baker Botts LLP. Andy joined Baker Botts Houston office in 1979, and in 1985, helped to open the firm's Dallas office. He has served as managing partner since 2012, and last year was reappointed for another term in that role. Under Andy's leadership, Baker Botts has continued to advance as one of the world's leading corporate law firms. Please join me in welcoming Andy Baker. Good morning. I think three welcomes is probably enough, and so I am certainly going to speak for about 90 seconds, less than, uh, uh, than the ambassador. Ambassador, thank you very much for those kind remarks. Um, we feel it's a privilege to join uh, with the Baker Institute and the Center for Energy Studies in talking about transitions in the energy industry. Um, our firm, uh, Baker Botts, has guided clients through transitions for a long time. We were founded 177 years ago. Perhaps Secretary Baker will talk a little bit more about this at lunch, but we were founded about three years after the invention um, of the telegraph, before 
electricity, the car, the atom bomb, television, radio, the internet, the Donald, all of these things, <laughs> all of these things are events or transitions in which we have worked with our clients and certainly in energy since the beginning, since Spindle Top, we have been working with energy clients in every part of the energy spectrum um, for over a hundred years. And that is why we are delighted, delighted to work uh, with the Baker Institute and bring together these, um, this fantastic set of four panels to discuss transitions today. This is part of a continuing commitment of Baker Botts and partnership with the Baker Institute. We have these planned and funded for many years to come. So with that, please enjoy the panel. Ken, thank you for your work. Ambassador, thank you for the work of your team. Let's get to studying some transitions in energy. So it's my privilege, uh, before we actually get started with the panel, to uh, invite Robert Johnston uh, up to the stage. Robert is the, uh, or RJ, as his friends call him, um, is the CEO of the Eurasia Group. Uh, Eurasia Group is uh, well known around the world for uh, geopolitical risk analysis and understanding international affairs and policy. And I think his talk is perfect to get the day started because it gives a geopolitical flavor to the issue of energy transitions. And that's something a lot of times we tend to forget about, uh, in particular when, um, uh, uh, when we think about energy transitions, the conversation tends to shift towards market structure and, and, and technology, but uh, there certainly is a very heavy geopolitical overlay that we need to consider as well. So with that, uh, Robert. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in Houston. Thank you very much to the Baker Institute and to Baker Botts for inviting me to keynote uh, the session here today. And it's truly an honor to be with uh, such distinguished academics and uh, corporate and financial leaders in our, in our sector. So hopefully I can set the tone here a little bit. <clears throat> so I guess I have a real opportunity here because with all those lovely opening remarks, no one has actually defined energy transitions yet. So I get to be the one that tells all of you what I think about it. Uh, which is great. So let's think about a couple transitions here. One version is what you hear a lot about where I'm from in DC and New York and other places. Uh, the idea that we're transitioning towards a decarbonized world. First in the power sector, then manufacturing, transportation, that's all underway. There's another version of energy transitions that we could talk about today that is more about a shift within the existing petroleum-based sector, meaning that the traditional producers, with all the geopolitical influence that goes from being a major oil producer, are losing ground to new producers like the US. What's probably happening is a little bit of both. And the challenge with that is that it makes it quite difficult for investors to discern what's going on. And that's a theme I'm going to come back to a little bit today. So let's start closer to home here in the US. I would say that we're a little bit of an outlier in the larger global energy transition, because our transition is mostly about the supply side, right? It's mostly about fracking. It's mostly about the growth of shale gas and tight oil, the shift of the US from a peak oil focused, energy insecure superpower to one that is focused under the current administration on the idea of energy dominance. Now, I would say that, as you can see here, there's lots happening in the private sector and at the state level, municipalities in terms of decarbonization and transformation on the demand side of the energy market. But right now in Washington, where I'm based, these things are sort of out of favor. It's not really the policy priority for the folks that you see here on the screen, which is President Trump and his energy team. So we're not really playing the leading role in the decarbonization story that we were perhaps in the previous administration, at least at the federal level, but there's lots happening beneath that that we could be focused on as well. Upstream conditions, this may be a little bit controversial, but as someone who travels around the world and looks at different upstream opportunities around the world and works with investors around the world, 
conditions here are actually pretty good, at least on a relative basis. So yes, prices could be higher. Uh, we'd like to see more clarity about what OPEC is doing and so forth, but it's a lot better here than other markets. Other upstream markets around the world, Africa, Latin America, even the Middle East, Russia, are really struggling with capital and trying to find a way to fund the next generation of upstream oil growth. That's not a challenge here in Houston, not to the same extent as it is elsewhere. So what then does the rest of the world look like? Congratulations, Chancellor Merkel, for being reelected again. I think that we think about energy transition in the rest of the world, there is a lot more of a focus on things like peak demand and decarbonization. And because the US is more secure in terms of our oil and gas supply, that also makes the rest of the world feel pretty secure as well. And they, in turn, are focusing on three areas, right? There's three drivers of the energy transition in the rest of the world. One is that they don't have the same level of domestic uh, resources that, that we have, certainly when we're talking about Europe and, and Asia in particular. Particularly in Asia, we have very strong concerns about air quality, and in some cases about the climate. And they also have a lot of focus and capacity for industrial policy. So unlike the US, where it's really about the supply side, in Asia and in Europe, which I symbolize here with uh, President Xi and Chancellor Merkel, these three drivers, and relative energy insecurity, air quality and climate concerns, and industrial policy are what's really driving the energy transition. Now, I would argue that in the US, really we have none of these, right? Our, we're pretty secure from an energy point of view. The climate agenda, at least the federal level, is not moving very quickly right now. We've already done a lot of work on air quality, and we don't really do industrial policy in the US. That's not really our thing. And I'll talk later about what I see in Europe and China that looks a little bit different. So globally, I think, if I go outside the US, I would really be thinking about Asia and the energy transition there on the demand side to go with the supply side revolution in the US, which is setting the stage, I think, for a clean tech revolution over there. So if I'm an investor, how am I going to digest all this? <clears throat> I think about the oil market, and I think about returns that you make investing in the oil sector, and I see it being sort of squeezed from three directions, which I sort of mentioned already. Right? The first is, of course, what we're all focused on and what we'll hear about next panel, the U.S. fracking revolution, the great boom in, in tight oil production that we're seeing here. The second is the big uncertainties about the Persian Gulf and the Middle East, both geopolitical stability and also OPEC policy and what that's going to look like going forward. And then on the demand side, which is mostly Asia these days, there's not a lot of demand growth in other parts of the world. It's really the question of what is the upside of the clean tech revolution taking place, particularly in the transportation sector in Asia. And I'll talk about that as well, because I think conditions in Asia are moving a lot faster than people realize towards a clean transportation revolution. We all know that US is outperforming, right? Frankly, there's just almost, as I said earlier, very little upstream oil and gas investment uh, in the rest of the world, right? The US is capturing the lion's share, and it's mostly in the shale play, and it's mostly here in Texas and Oklahoma. This has significant political implications. Right, and what this shows basically is the year-over-year -year change in upstream oil and gas investment. And the US, of course, is the large bar to the right. Now, some of these regions, like the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, can finance their own upstream development. They went to the bond market, I think, for 12 billion yesterday. Uh, other regions, like Latin America, Africa, Russia, not as easy. So we'd expect to see some slowdown in production growth in those markets. But the US is the place where investors want to be. Why? Because at least in this sector, political risk is relatively low returns are decent, and it's short cycle, right? Capital's coming in and out of the assets fairly quickly uh, compared to other longer cycle plays around the world. That said, I'm sure we'll hear many people saying this today, but we don't think the U.S. shale oil alone will be enough to balance the markets, right? And I would expect that by 2022, we're going to have a pretty significant uh, gap between supply and demand when you account for what we know about U.S. shale growth and we account for the oil sands and the deep water projects that are underway. So the question is, if everyone agrees that there's a supply gap coming, why aren't we seeing more investment now? Right? This is so obvious, what's holding back? Why aren't we seeing more deep water activity? Why are companies leaving the oil sands in Canada rather than investing? And there's gonna be some interesting theories about that, I'm sure, in the discussion today. Especially when we consider the deep water costs, right? The deep water costs have come down quite a bit, and I don't know how well I can see this, but basically shows different plays around the world mostly tiebacks and kind of brownfield expansions, 
that are in the 40 to $50 range for break even, right? Pretty similar to what we see in the US shale or maybe a little bit lower in some cases. This is complemented by the fact that a lot of the governments, particularly in Brazil and Mexico, which have significant deep water assets are moving away from a resource nationalist model and creating more opportunities for investors. But even with that, we're not seeing a lot of investment taking place here. So why is that? Maybe a little bit controversial, but I think peak demand is playing a role here, right? Not that I have the magic answer of exactly when demand will peak globally for crude and then how quickly it declines after that. But if you look at people who are a lot smarter than me, like my clients, the super majors, the IEA and so forth, they're all over the place. Some say there's never gonna be a peak. Some say the peak is happening in like seven or eight years. So for investors, thinking about those long cycle investments like deep water and oil sands, this is a little bit scary. Because these are projects that have you know, 25, 30 year payouts, and you don't really know what you're going to get in terms of um, peak demand. Now, this is not an issue for the US shale, right? If you're investing right now in the Permian, you'll have your capital back long before peak demand becomes an issue. I think that's another factor reinforcing um, the attractiveness of the US relative to other markets. But if we do get to a peak demand world, I'm not saying we will, but as a thought exercise and somebody who does geopolitics for a living, what does that really mean, right? What do we really expect in a peak demand world or even a world of call it slower demand or decelerating demand or lower for longer? I think we're already seeing early stages, right? We're seeing countries like Venezuela and Nigeria that really have political structures and economies that were built for $100 oil and just don't have the strength in the political institutions or the economic diversification to survive in a $50 world. And as a result, there's a lot of political people in those places. The next group of countries, the purple country here, are countries that are not really gonna see any kind of political instability, but are gonna face challenges tra attracting investment, right? Because again, the higher cost plays in the Brazilian deep water, Mexican deep water, Colombian onshore, Canadian oil sands, really were much more geared for $70, $80 crude as well. And they don't necessarily have the resources and capital themselves to fund the next generation of growth. But, but the big question, of course, is the mega producers. What happens to the Iranians, the Saudis, the Russians in a world of lower oil prices and slowing demand, if that indeed is what we get to? I would say in the short to medium term, they're fine. There's plenty of people willing to lend the Saudis money. The Iranians have had sanctions lifted and we're starting to see some interest, at least from European and Asian companies going back there. Russia may be uh, struggling for investment a little bit, but Putin's strong political control of Ru the Russian economy and the Russian political system means that there's not really a lot of space for any kind of um, you know, uprising or backlash if, if prices do continue lower. But you would have to think that in the longer term, 2030, 2025, that if we stay in this oil price environment, because these countries are so dependent on oil revenue, you could see geopolitical instability rise there. And that, of course, would feed back into the prices as well. That's the long term. What about the short term? I would say as an analyst and an observer of markets, I have to ask this question, whatever happened to risk premium? I used to come to Houston five years ago, 10 years ago, and everyone was sitting on the edge of their seat saying, well, what's gonna happen to the next half a million barrels a day in Nigeria or in Iraq or, or you know, in Venezuela? Because the markets were so tight, inventories were low, US was importing 30, 40% more than we are now. But right now with high inventories, moderately slower demand, a sense that the US is in this energy dominance mode, these supply shocks, which have not gone away, are just not getting the same traction in the market. So we could spend all day going through the list. The one or two that I would focus on, certainly the Saudi succession, right? Can we see a stable and peaceful transfer of power from King Salman to Mohammed bin Salman? Will the Ramco IPO take place? Can they continue to survive with a $50 billion budget deficit? What are the prospects for turmoil in Saudi Arabia? Our base cases will probably make it through, but the market might be a little bit too complacent on this one. Libya and Venezuela and Nigeria are probably already priced in the kind of instability and disruption we see in those countries. But I would also add Iran, right? President Trump's policies towards Iran, the questions around recertifying the nuclear agreement, does that actually happen? If not, what does it mean? Are we talking secondary sanctions again? Do we re-escalate the military tensions in the region? So there's lots of supply shocks that are still out there, just the market isn't that focused on it right now. But what about the demand shocks? Right? Crude oil is very much tied to global economic growth. Global economic growth is very much tied to trade. And look, the trade picture is not as rosy as it was. Renegotiating NAFTA, 
U.S.-China trade tensions, Brexit. At some point, does that weigh on the market? Or maybe it already is. Maybe that's one reason why we've got this sort of flat curve, right? There's just not a lot of confidence in the demand picture going forward, especially if you see a slowdown or new barriers to global trade. So we have to think about the demand shocks as well. Briefly mention the fact that we've got more geopolitics on the downstream side as well. I've talked a lot about the uh, geopolitics on the upstream side. But the downstream side is interesting. And what I see is the major producers like Saudi Arabia and Russia really working hard to lock in market share for their barrels in Asia, right? Maybe a sense that that Asia premium isn't there anymore and that having national oil company partners in places like Malaysia and Vietnam is critical to make sure you have an outlet for your crude oil. And we also know that the Persian Gulf countries in particular want to move further downstream and add more petrochemical and refining investment as well. And that will have a big impact on refineries elsewhere, particularly in Europe and India and elsewhere. I would also say that OPEC countries, as they contemplate moving further into the downstream, have to take account of the fact that we have so much U.S. crude being exported now as well. A lot of it's going to Europe, which is a prospective market for, um, for uh, you know, the Saudis, but some of it's starting to go to Asia as well. And that's a new factor for the markets to consider here as well. Let me conclude just talking a little bit about natural gas and, and clean tech, as I mentioned at the beginning. It's no secret, I'm sure the afternoon panel will go into this a lot more than I will now. But the big story here, of course, is that the uh, light green and, and uh, dark blue colors, the US and Australia, bring on a lot of LNG supply that the market is struggling to absorb. That's where we are today, and that's what everyone is focused on today. But if we look forward, where's the LNG demand gonna come from? And in my view, if the oil geopolitics are all about the supply side, then the gas geopolitics are much more about the demand side, right? Specifically, in these emerging LNG importers, what role will governments play in putting their thumb on the scale to advantage or disadvantage gas relative to other fuels? And domestic politics and energy policy will play a huge role in that. But we do see Asia, whether it's Korea, new government policy shutting down coal and nuclear, India, Southeast Asia with air quality concerns. We do see a promising story, especially for US LNG. One risk as well is how do gas and renewables partner? And I'm sure we'll hear about that in, in the panels today as well. We know that gas and renewables are very complementary, but who's really gonna be in the lead there? What's the real base load? Particularly when you factor in energy storage. If we look at the markets where um, you know, LNG imports are up this year, right? China, of course, South Korea, Japan, but also newer markets like India and Pakistan, right? And these are the markets of the future. Right now, they don't have much in the way of government regulation or a wholesale market to absorb a lot of gas, but I think that will change in the future as these governments put more priority on, on clean natural gas as an alternative to, uh, to coal. The gas partnership with renewables, if you look here, you can see significant uh, penetration for solar and wind. Uh, some of the biggest bars here, as I mentioned earlier, in Europe, uh, you know, looking at Saudi Arabia, looking at China, looking at you know, 2010 versus 2030, how much more solar and wind are we going to see? And again, that's probably one of the biggest risks for natural gas, right? As to what degree does this actually enable more natural gas demand in these markets, or does it actually displace natural gas? And that's gonna be a big question to track here as we look at the energy transition as well. I'm much more focused though on the clean tech revolution and transportation side. Because frankly, I think the clean tech story and power is maturing very rapidly. And we're seeing a lot of our client interest shift more to transportation as we see the solar and wind reach grid priority and, and greater market share penetration. I spent three weeks in Asia this summer looking into this. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think because of these three factors, air quality concerns, industrial policy, and energy insecurity, we're seeing strong government focus in places like China, Japan, Korea on clean transportation. Right, clean transportation is a priority for the Made in China 2025 plan, where the government is putting huge resources into things like batteries, into materials, in other areas where they think they can be a world leader in the next generation of passenger vehicles. It's not about replicating what we're already doing here in the US with SUVs and light trucks, right, and ICE vehicles. It's about the next generation. They're also talking about things like electrifying the railroads, Right? They're talk you go to Beijing, now you see the bicycles have all come back and the bicycle sharing programs may sound like nothing, but between the bicycle sharing programs and the ride sharing programs, it's really eating into gasoline demand. And the Chinese are finding overcapacity now, from what I can see, is about 40, 
They're looking at a super grid through their Belt and Road Initiative to try to connect some of those renewable resources in places like Mongolia and Russia back into China and to other parts of Asia. If we look at Japan, we can talk about what they're doing with hydrogen, what Toyota is doing, and what they plan to do for the 2020 Olympics. Uh, try to get away from the electrification challenges by using fuel cells, and that's something that's advancing pretty quickly. The Korean National Green Growth Strategy, smart cities that pull a lot of these different ideas together, all the renovations around ride sharing and fleet utilization. It goes on and on and on, right? If it's going to happen anywhere in terms of clean transportation revolution, I think it's going to happen in Asia. In fact, I think it's already happening. Right? I think the political direction in Washington is towards something very different, as I mentioned, in terms of energy dominance. I think these countries want to be dominant in clean transportation. And they know how to do industrial policy. They know how to get the state, the big state-owned enterprises, the universities, the private sector all working together. It may not be as efficient as what we do over here, but it has a lot of muscle behind it. So watch out for the hydrogen program in Japan. Pay attention to the uh, electric batteries being developed in China and Korea. It's going to have a big impact on our crude demand story. We already see that in the transportation sector, the rate of demand growth for oil has slowed, right? It was, it, it's gone from about 1.3% a year down to about 0.6. That's what the IA is forecasting through 2040. Still growing. That's why I think peak demand is a little bit of a misleading term. But the fact is it's starting to slow, right? It's not growing at the same rate that it was in transportation. On the other hand, the petrochemical sector demand is growing still at a pretty healthy clip. But because demand is so concentrated in Asia, I think that transition in Asia towards clean transportation will have a huge impact on this data. Where is the demand actually taking place? Of course, we know it's taking place in the emerging markets, especially in Asia. Right now, um, OPEC is forecasting pretty significant growth in road transportation demand in the um, developing countries, right? Especially compared to the OECD. The OECD demand is actually going down a little bit. but the big question is, what kind of vehicles will they be? Is this all going to be internal combustion engines, or will we see more hydrogen? Will we see more electric vehicles? When the OPEC and IEA do their forecasts, they tend to use current technology and current policy. And those things are changing very quickly, especially in Asia. So in conclusion, a few points, maybe to start some conversation for the rest of the day. I think we're probably past the peak supply era given the changes in the U.S. market and the kind of focal point of U.S. energy policy from 1973, probably to about 2011, 2012. But that's assuming we have geopolitical stability, right? One or two geopolitical shocks in the markets I mentioned earlier could bring the peak supply discussions back quite quickly, especially for our major trading partners and ally. Peak demand, I don't know. And my super major clients don't know either. Their forecasts are all over the place. but. I do know, and what I can see and measure, is that the demand growth is more fragile than it used to be, and it's also more concentrated in Asia, particularly in China and India. So these energy transitions and public policy and industrial policy changes in those countries will have a huge impact on demand. Who are the dominant producers? I would say Saudi Arabia and the U.S. for oil, U.S. and Russia for natural gas, but what does dominant really mean? Does it mean it's the best place to invest? Does it mean it's the biggest producer? Does it translate into some kind of geopolitical leverage? That's an interesting theme for discussion today as well. Probably all of the above. Who are the losers here? I think as we look at energy transitions, I look at Latin America, Africa, the oil sands, some of the deep water, Russia, as places that are going to struggle to attract capital. And we see a lot of the upstream capital going back into Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf, and of course here in, in Texas with the US shale as well. And then who's going to win this clean tech energy technology race? Transportation, smart cities, power generation. I think the Asians are already winning, right? And I think there's a lot of rhetoric in Europe. There was a lot of rhetoric under the previous administration um, about this. But the real dollars and the real manufacturing and the muscle are in Asia. And that's going to be a big geopolitical story to watch in the future as well. So I hope that set the scene. We covered a lot of territory. And I think each panel will go into these topics in more detail, but again, thank you very much to the Baker Institute and the Baker Bots for having me here today, and I look forward to your questions. So, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, pass them to the aisles. Uh, people pick them up. I'm going to start it off with one. Um, you sort of pointed out 
uh, what really amounts to a significant amount of tension in global markets with you know, supply side revelations uh, occurring in certain parts of the world, demand side revelations and others. Where does the dust set? Yeah. And who are the big winners and losers? I think you sort of began to hint at that, but I'd like to give you a little bit more insight. I guess I, I, think, I do think that um, the losers really are some of the markets, frankly, where our company did a lot of business over the years, right? We're just not seeing the same kind of upstream investment in most parts of Latin America, certainly in Africa, certainly the former Soviet Union. Just because there's overall a smaller pool of capital available for the upstream, and it's a lot more selective in where it's going. And it's going to the US, and I think it will go to Saudi once they move forward with their Aramco IPO. Um, so I think the US will continue to be a winner on this front. If I had to bet in a deep water, I would bet on Brazil and Mexico, notwithstanding the two elections there next year, which creates some uncertainty. But if we get past that, I think both those governments have figured out that they can't do it on their own, they can't be resource nationalists, and they need to partner with foreign capital to move forward on those great resources they have down there. I don't see that in Russia, I don't see that in other Latin American markets like Venezuela, I don't see that in places like Nigeria as well. What, that's all fairly transparent. What's less transparent is Asia and on the demand side, and that's why I was interested in going there to look into this myself, because all the people who, in companies that are dominating in the space of there, we've never heard of or unless you're following the sector quite closely, you haven't heard of. You know, the BYDs and GLEs and you know, maybe the SK in, in Korea, those types. I mean, they're really innovating and they have that strong incentive to do so. Energy and security, industrial policy, air quality concerns. So I would say that um, the future is very much going to be about clean transportation and the winners in Asia, as well as the upstream winners here um, in the US and probably in Saudi as well. Okay, so I have a couple of questions uh, focused on transportation, and I'm gonna try to blend them together uh, in the interest of time. Um, there's some interest in, in particular in what the most impactful new development in the transportation sector will be. Will it be batteries? Will it be autonomous vehicles? What about biodiesel developments in Europe, et cetera? Yeah, I wish I knew, <laughs> but I would say that um, just like when we were, say, 2003, 2005, or go back a little further, late 70s, early 80s. At that time, when we were in a world of peak supply and oil shocks, we attacked the problem from multiple directions. Offshore, Arctic, unconventionals, right? New frontier uh, markets, cold liquids, all those things. I think the same thing is happening now on the demand side, right? The Asian governments, China, India, Japan, Korea, et cetera, they understand that they have supply insecurity they can't sustain the kind of transportation growth with internal combustion engines. So they too are attacking it from multiple directions. It is gonna be the biofuels. It is gonna be the batteries. It will be hydrogen. It will be electrification of things like rail. The one that I think is lagging is aviation. Right? I think aviation is, is behind uh, the road transportation in terms of some of these innovations. But I don't think there will be a single technology that will be the big break breakthrough. I would say it's more a portfolio. And that each country will have a specialization uh, or at least a, a leading sector, probably batteries in China, hydrogen in Japan, and so forth. Uh, but it will be a portfolio approach. Um, one last question, uh, and this is related specifically to some recent announcements made by governments around the world with regard to electric vehicle sales. A couple of countries in Europe announced only EVs by 2040. China made an announcement of trying to develop a pathway to only EV sales. Do you think those will be successful efforts? Uh, and if so, which of your scenarios that you sort of painted do you think is most likely to come to pass? Yeah, you may have noticed I didn't even mention anything in Europe. It's just, it's just not that interested, I'm sorry. I mean, they're just not, there's so much announcements and so little actual action that Norway and Netherlands phasing out electric vehicles, I'm, I'm just that much, I'm much more interested in what the Chinese and Indians are doing. So when China announced it, it did catch my attention a lot more, especially because you can see, it may not work, but they do have a plan. And the plan is based around industrial policy. And I think that um, these announcements are probably an early indicator. And if you look behind the scenes, sometimes we're talking about hybrids, sometimes we're talking about you know, other types of electric vehicles. Um, but I don't think that uh, Europe will be as big a story here as Asia, mostly because the demand growth in Europe has already gone anyway. And it's a much easier transition for them, given the size of those markets. Germany would be interesting, but almost everywhere else, not that interesting. So it really comes down to what happens, I think, in China, China and Northeast Asia. Everybody uh, join me in thanking RJ. Thank you very much.
All right, I'd like to invite the, the first panel up. Um, uh, the moderator is Francisco Minaldi. He's our, our fellow in Latin American energy policy, and he will handle the panelist introductions. Welcome. Uh, this is going to be the panel on, on global oil, and we have a, a, a terrific uh, set of uh, speakers. Uh, so I'm uh, um, uh, very happy to be um, the, the moderator of this panel. We will have our four speakers will have uh, will give initial remarks of about uh, eight to ten minutes. And then we will have a uh, discussion, as an, uh, Ken mentioned. You can uh, send us uh, your questions uh, so that I can uh, introduce them to the, uh, to the panelists. So the, uh, our panelists are uh, Jean-Francois Poupot, the uh, Executive Vice President of Corporate Engagement uh, uh, from Schlumberger. Uh, Gregory Hill, the president and COO of Hess Corporation. Bobby Tudor, the chairman of Tudor Pickering Holt. And Jason Bennett, uh, a partner in, in Baker Botts. And they will uh, give their initial remarks in that, uh, in that order. Uh, Robert did a terrific job in uh, putting over the table the key uh, energy transitions that we are uh, facing. Um, you know, we are uh, seeing a, a totally different supply curve, and that's already sort of an event that, that has already happened, but it's ongoing. We have an attempt by some players uh, like OPEC and other countries to try to reduce the excess uh, inventories um, to rebalance the market. We have this massive technological change that uh, Robert mentioned uh, that it's not only uh, affecting the oil supply, but also uh, the substitute of oil uh, and particular uh, renewables. We have this possible transition in transportation with the electric vehicles, autonomous cars, and uh, we will, of course, have a, a panel on technological change later on, but all these things are, are affecting. And of course, we have the, the issue of uh, climate uh, policy, the possibility of uh, either a carbon tax or other uh, uh, policy directed to, to, uh, to change this. So uh, I hope we can get to, to uh, some, of these, um, uh, some of these topics. And uh, uh, I know that they, they, have, they will cover some of them in the initial remarks and then in the discussion. So uh, having said that, you, you have their, their uh, bios in, in your uh, programs, uh, so I will not you know, bother with uh, more details. So having said that, uh, let's start with uh, Jean-Francois. Thank you, uh, Francisco. Good morning, everybody. Um, so it's great to be here for the Center of um, Energy Studies and Baker Botts for putting this together. And as, uh, as the first speaker, I'd like to lay out a little, uh, you know, a few of the elements that may stimulate uh, further uh, discussion uh, going forward. <clears throat> as soon as I get it to click, there we go. So um, just a little bit on the, the challenge side of the equation. So, you know, despite medium pricing over the last uh, two and a half, three years, uh, global oil production has been relatively resilient and uh, upstream capex has been slashed and the industry has really suffered tremendously. Our company, Schlumberger, has had to reduce its workforce for well north of 50,000 individuals. It's around 40% of our workforce. And the businesses, not only ours, but the businesses around our industry have been extremely challenged. Global E&P has, uh, spend has been um, fallen, you know, about 50% so from its record high of around 700 billion in 2014. The price of Brent, of Brent has gone from 115 down to as low as uh, 27 before stabilizing where we are today, um, you know, around $50. Um, the estimate for upstream uh, job losses is around 425,000 workers, but yet the production has been uh, resilient, as you can see from the graphic. It is in fact has grown from 92 million barrels uh, per day in 2013 to uh, around 98 million per day at uh, the end of last year. So if we look at um, the, uh, the demand, you know, uh, we saw supply was solid. Demand has been forecast to continuously grow um, 
uh, around uh, well, we, what was shown, in fact, by, by data, you know, was growth of around 10% over the last eight years. Um, and the level of ease of substitution is not high. Um, so, um, you know, there's a growth in energy demand forecast, and these forecasts are, are quite solid. The agencies re keep revising demand forecasts uh, for 17 and 18 upwards, based on the strong uh, Q2-17 figures. And there's, uh, you know, some expected uh, strengthening of uh, economies in the, on the east side. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the supply decline uh, involvement by OPEC is certainly, you know, involved in here in the rebalancing. And uh, all in all, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot has been talked about, you know, uh, lately about renewable energy and how we're going to start to experience this in the, the energy transition. And uh, this is, will indeed you know, affect the future of um, the oil industry. So a lot of talk about uh, EVs, electric vehicles, um, but however, by 2040, you know, all forecasts still show that they make a relatively you know, low single digit uh, percentage of um, the, the transportation in terms of fuel needs. So um, you know, there are selected regions uh, that are going to have a higher um, EV incentives, as was uh, spoken about by, um, by Robert. And uh, by 2040, certainly there will be a higher share. But if we look at, you know, closer to, to home, at oil supply, that's going to take us to these points, we have to segment the strategies into short and long cycles. This was mentioned also by, by Robert. Um, in the short term, uh, focus on um, uh, short cycle leads us to actually uh, higher depletion rates of our um, uh, resources. That's been the scenario of our downturn. And um, you know, there, we've seen several countries uh, growing production, but their depletion rates have actually accelerated at the same time enormously. So these depletion rate trends um, will only accelerate going forward if production continues to, uh, to be upheld without significant additional uh, proven developed reserves uh, brought about through increased uh, upstream capex spend. So we would be heading towards a, uh, a supply crunch in the coming years unless there's a significant global increase in EMP spend. Now, in, on the right side of the graphic, longer cycles really imply larger facilities and investments. So I'm not going to talk very much about that. But let me now focus briefly on closer to home, the unconventionals. So you can see from the, uh, the left side of this graphic here that uh, the North American unconventionals are really the largest contributor to the global oil production additions over the next uh, four years ahead of us. Uh, following which, on the right side of the graphic, uh, deep water projects are forecasted to contribute uh, additionally. So in this context, will the shale productivity continue to improve? Uh, are shale economics going to be uh, sustainable? Um, certainly higher service prices have started to push the shale break even, um, break evens higher. Recent cost cuts in shales were driven mainly by uh, cyclical components, and break-even prices started rising uh, cyclically. Um, and new efficiencies, new methodologies are struggling to offset that. So as unconventionals require a lot of uh, services, um, this translates into material impacts to the communities and the environments where these are located. And as an industry, we need to ensure that we are the best stewards uh, for the extraction of these resources. At Schlumberger, we have uh, developed a dual mission engagement pertaining to what we like to call global stewardship. Internally, we strive to perform at the highest levels of social and environmental standards. And externally, our R&D machine uh, delivers technologies and processes that enable our customers to ultimately achieve their own ESG objectives. So stewardship, you know, for those of this might be a new word for you. So let me just give you the definition so we all walk out of here with the same a dictionary, so really an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. This is a, the concept of stewardship uh, can certainly be applied to the environment, to nature, to economics, to health, to property, and to information. So in order to uh, deliver on these goals to develop the resources in this context, we have to address all of our stakeholders. These stakeholders are numerous, as you can see from the left side of the graphic here, and all of their interests have to be taken into account in order to ensure that we maintain a social contract to operate. Um, at Schlumberger, we've developed a tool that we're extremely excited about, that we're making available to the public domain, 
uh, which is going to certainly contribute to uh, this challenge. And we call this tool the Global Stewardship Tool. It's a, a software that uh, allows our stakeholders to uh, analyze and meet their respective uh, sustainability KPIs, some of which are on the, on the right side here. Um, this tool, in fact, was developed internally at Schlumberger, and we're releasing it to the public domain at the end of this year. Um, so suffice it to say that technology going forward certainly has a very large role to play in the journey to, to deliver increasing volumes of hydrocarbons. Uh, tools such as this one, uh, we uh, forecast will be utilized by all of the actors, the stakeholders, from the governments to the operators to the service companies. And uh, sustainability uh, and all of the aspects associated with sustainability need to be addressed as we progress along this journey. So thank you very much. Now we'll have Greg Hill. Thank you, Jean-Francois. All right, well, thank you, uh, John francois and thank you, Baker and Botts, and thank you for the Baker Institute. Um, I'm going to be very brief because I think we're, we're all kind of saying a lot of the, a lot of the same things. Um, but I want, I want to just set some overall um, context for the audience and then more importantly for our panel discussion um, coming up. Now, I'm going to talk about what is arguably um, one of the most difficult things to do and that is the ability to predict what the oil price is going to be, and more importantly, the timing of when oil price changes. Many have tried, all have failed. Um, yeah, but however, you know, even in this lower for longer world, I think sometimes, whether it's a high price or a low price, you tend to get blinded um, with the short term. And so I think there are some very powerful underlying forces at work that are definitely going to drive the oil price up. Now, like I said, what I don't know is, will that occur, occur in 19, 20, 20, 21? Um, my colleague mentioned there's geopolitical shocks, there's economic shocks, there's all kinds of uncertainty in that, but there's a lot of fundamental drivers that simply cannot be ignored. I think this works, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, disclaimer, I have to show that. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is a complicated puzzle, right? Um, when you think about oil demand and oil supply, um, and of course the major factors that are going to drive demand, as some of the speakers have already noted, you know, how is global population growth going to shape demand? What are the trends in, in uh, global population growth? How is rising wealth, the rise of the East, GDP growth, how does all, all that come into demand? And then in a carbon constrained world, what can we expect from energy efficiency, electric vehicles? As my colleague said, will peak oil occur? And if so, when will it occur? And then finally, on the, the major puzzle pieces on the supply side, as we know, is you know, oil and gas assets are depleting assets by their very nature. So this is going, ongoing investment is absolutely required uh, to keep the supply going. Um, obviously, OPEC is huge. Uh, what is their policy? How do we think about their fiscal stability? You know, all those things. And then finally, unconventionals. What role is that going to play uh, in the revolution? How long can unconventionals be a growth uh, province? Um, how long will it last? Will it be able to cover you know, the demand of the world? So let's turn to uh, demand first. You know, years ago, um, you know, there was a discussion about peak oil, and I was in Shell at the time. And, of course, that was peak oil on the supply side. And then Disruptor came, called Unconventionals and Technology. That went away. Now there's a theory about peak oil demand. When is that going to happen? Um, and it's largely driven by what my colleague talked about earlier. How is electrification and how are these things going to play in? Well, again, you have to look at kind of the underlying mega trends, I call it. So the population of the world is going to grow. It's going to grow from about 7 billion to 9 billion between now and 2040. That is an inevitable truth that you cannot escape that. GDP per capita is going to grow as well. So if you look on a worldwide scale, that's going to double. 
Um, you know, in the OECD, it'll double. Um, you know, in other parts of uh, the world, it will double. In China, it's going to triple. In India, it's going to triple. And in the non-OECD, it's going to triple as well. So the, this will happen as people come out of poverty, and I think it's fantastic that they are. Of course, when they come out of poverty, you know, they want all the things we want. They want homes, they want air conditioners, they want cars, they want all those things. And again, that is, you know, that is an absolutely inescapable truth, and it's good for the world if that does happen. Um, so then, then you get into, okay, let's talk about cars and the transport demand and all that. So, you know, the current transport demand of the, you know, 93 or 92 or 93 million barrels of oil demand, about half of that, 50, 50, uh, 50 million barrels a day is dedicated primarily to transport. Where's that going to go? Well, if you believe those GDP rates and you believe those population gro uh, growth rates, that's going to go from about 50 million barrels today to 60 million barrels by 2040. So it is going to grow. Now, some of my colleagues said, okay, electric vehicles and how does all that play in? We're going to go from 900 cars to 2 billion cars by then. Um, if you assume that maybe half of those are electric vehicles, you're only going to impact the oil demand by about 1.3 million barrels a day by the time you get out there. So, like some of my other colleagues said, it's not a huge driver. Why is that? Because the biggest part of the transport load actually is those other sectors. It's airplanes. It's long-haul ships. It's long-haul trucks. It's rail. And, and actually, uh, you know, electrifying that sector or getting away from oil being the primary transport mechanism is going to be very difficult. And there's a simple fact. A kilogram of, of gas or liquid, you know, liquid hydrocarbon has 60 times the energy capacity of a kilogram of a battery. And when you get into long haul and these kind of things, that is just an inescapable truth on the power curve that's really, really hard to get over. Because you need that power when you're hauling very heavy things. Very different than if you're running around a city. You know, I get that. But, so I don't believe that even though electric vehicles are going to play a big part and it's huge, I just don't believe it's going to have a, a, giant, uh, a huge effect on the, the overall uh, global oil demand. So for that reason, I agree with the IEA that global oil demand is going to grow primarily driven by road and uh, air transportation. Now let's look at the supply side. You know, the supply side, it, to me, has, has some of the more worrying trends that are going to drive this, uh, drive the answer here. <clears throat> you know, as the IEA says, you need about um, uh, 500 to 600 billion dollars of investment every year to maintain oil and gas production flat, okay? First year after the downturn, that was about 550. The next year, it was 380. This year, it's going to be about 410. So we are substantially underinvesting in what it's going to take, you know, to drive that supply. So you know, conventional reservoirs in the world right now they can they uh, decline about two to three million barrels a day every year. So how how are you going to replace all that? OPEC's already been mentioned. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, fiscal break-evens of the OPEC countries, if you kind of blur your eyes and average, you kind of say, well, it's got to be at least at least above 60, uh, you know, to kind of break even. And then if I added Russia on here, Russia would be about 70 to $75 for break even. So this is not sustainable. It is absolutely not sustainable. So oil prices have to go up. And so if you ask me, um, you know, will OPEC extend the cuts? I believe they will. And this is why, um, you know, Vision 2030, all those things are going to require, <clears throat> you know, an IPO. These are all going to require things, particularly in Saudi Arabia, where they have to, they have to get the oil price to go up. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of press and, and things about U.S. tight oil production. Be absolutely certain it is a major force in the supply side. But if you look at how much is really going to grow, it's maybe going to grow 700,000 barrels a day a year, maybe a million. Now remember, demand's 1.4 to 1.6, and remember, decline at these investment levels is probably two to three million barrels. 
So as you get out, obviously what that means when you put these two together is that you know there is going to be a supply shortage. Now this is based on IEA data. Um, it shows it emerging in 2019, uh, you know, to 2020. Um, and of course, uh, what this means is, and some of both of my colleagues before me have said, you know, for investors and whatnot, and certainly for companies, is you are going to have to, or the world is going to have to invest in other things besides shale. So offshore will be the next cab off the rank that's gonna fill that supply need. Now remember what I said about the investment levels going into that sector. The offshore has been effectively decimated. Um, and so, uh, you're, you know, there's gonna have to, have to be a rapid uh, pickup of investment in the offshore in order to avoid this. And I think it's, I think it's in inevitable that it's coming. So certainly my company, we're a bit of an outlier. We're a bit different. Uh, we have a balanced strategy. It's one of unconventionals, and it's one of offshore. Um, and the reason we, uh, we have pursued that strategy is, is because we believe that the world is going to need those uh, conventional as well as unconventional resources to uh, solve the problem, and we think there's a lot of great investment opportunities there. Case in point, chart on the right is our recent you know, offshore Guyana where, with our partner Exxon and Nexon. We've discovered two and a half billion barrels of light oil in uh, offshore Guyana with much more to come, lots more prospects, and it has a break even of about $35 a barrel. So there will be outstanding investments in the offshore and in other places, and they, they must play an absolutely critical part in uh, avoiding another supply shock uh, in, the, uh, in the oil and gas sector. So thank you very much. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Bobby Tudor. Um, I would note that, that Greg followed the number one rule of oil price, oil price forecasting, which is that if you give a price, never give a date. And if you give a date, never give a price. That's, that's, that's rule, rule number one. We learned that in investment banking, by the, by the way. We're, we're good at that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning uh, just about the impact that uh, technology and technology changes are having on oil price, and in particular on what's happening uh, here in, in North America. Uh, the the uh, quick thesis, if you will, is that as a result of the big decline in oil price from, you know, call it 80 to, to 40, uh, more or less, that happened beginning in late 2014, uh, the U.S. oil and gas business has reduced their cost dramatically and via improved technology has improved the estimated ultimate recoveries per well dramatically. And the fact of that is it's driven down break-even prices uh, almost, almost by half, really across the board uh, in the U.S. Most of this is related to improved well completion uh, techniques. Um, a lot of it is sort of brute force, longer laterals, more propent, more fluid, et cetera. But increasingly, it's, it's uh, higher levels of technology, true machine learning, big data applications, sensors, uh, et cetera. And I think we would argue that we're still actually in the very, very early stages of, of technology truly impacting uh, the, the break-even cost uh, of wells in the United States. Now, uh, d d despite the fact that when you pump more sand and you pump more water and you drill longer laterals, it costs more, d despite that, uh, we have driven uh, the break-evens down uh, a lot. Part of that is because costs have gone down. And as Jean-Francois uh, mentioned, uh, some amount of that cost improvement is, is uh, cyclical, and you're going to give it up on the way back up. I think the big debate is how much of it is, is structural. I would point out that Jean-Francois works for a service provider. He thinks it's all cyclical. Greg works for a producer. He thinks it's all structural. The, the, the truth is that it's probably somewhere uh, in between those two, and, and then, in fact, uh, some of those cost improvements will, uh, will be given away as, as you go back up. You'll see in a moment a, char a chart that, that shows you that most of the big global projects around the world need at least $40, and in many cases a lot more than $40 to in fact break even. And so what you have is a big business here in the United States that has lower break evens than most big projects almost anywhere uh, in, in the world. 
So this is just a, a, a little a stage setting, if you will, uh, around kind of the size of the opportunity here in the United States. So the top green bar is the Permian Basin, uh, and just above it is Guar in Saudi Arabia. So, so those of you who follow uh, kind of the lore of the oil business, people speak in awe of guar. When, when the word guar comes out of someone's mouth, everyone says, oh my gosh, guar. There's guar and there's everything else. Well, it turns out there's guar and there's the Permian Basin. Uh, and they're, they are roughly, roughly the same size. And so the, 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 this is a new chart, right? We would not have had this chart on the board five years ago or 10 years ago or, or, or 20 years ago. You wouldn't have thought about comparing these, uh, these two fields as it regards estimated ultimate recoveries in the field. So this, this is why this is such a big deal here in the United States. So this is really kind of my, my, my key chart, and it's probably a little hard to read from where you are, but just to describe it for you, across the bottom, uh, we have the major producing basins uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, and the, the uh, axis on the left is the break-even price. The dotted red line is today's price, more or less, $50, $51. And the color of the bars are, are the years. So um, the blue bar is the break-even price you would have needed. So, so for example, go to um, the third set in where it says Delaware Wolf Camp Tier 1, right? So that is the heart of what's good in the Permian Basin of West Texas, right? And so in 2014, you would have needed almost $60 a barrel to have a break-even well. We call break-even a 10% IRR on an average well in the basin. So you would have needed almost $60 in 2014. The gray bar is 2017. So in 2017, you need about $22. So your break-even is effectively gone from $58 to $22, given improvements in, in technology, higher estimated ultimate recoveries, and lower cost. And so as you look across this chart, you would see that in 2014, in almost every producing basin in the US, you would have needed well above where current oil price is today. And today, you need well below where current oil price is today. This is now a comparison to bigger projects around the world. These are mostly deep water projects. And if you look on the far right, these are kind of full cycle break evens. And you look up and down this chart and you say, well, you know, it ranges from 17 on the low side to, you know, 50 ish on the high side. Doesn't feel all that different from the numbers you just showed me before, break even unconventionals in North America. Uh, and that's true. But what, ha what you have to remember is that you never drill a dry hole in the Permian Basin. Right, and you drill a lot of dry holes offshore. So arguably, you, you can't repair, you can't just compare return to return and say, well, they're equal. It has to be risk adjusted. And if you think about the amount of capital that is, has been spent in the industry in deep water exploration, not just deep water exploration, but big ticket exploration around the world over the course of the past decade, results have been awful. Truly, truly awful. The, the, the amount of capital that's been destroyed uh, effectively in this venture is kind of mind blowing. So as, as you might imagine, boards of directors um, have been allocating exploration budgets to these big companies for a long time with very poor returns. And they look at what's going on here and they say, well, returns might not be fantastic, but they're not gonna be zero. And so I like the idea of having a big component of short cycle, less risky um, capital in my portfolio. And so what you've seen is everyone from Amarada Hess to Chevron to ExxonMobil to Statoil have shifted capital away from big ticket uh, deep water exploration towards uh, this more manufacturing oriented onshore U.S. business. And so you've seen this explosion of capital go to the business in the U.S. and go away from the business in other parts of the world. The com the, the, this is just the components of the slide. We have well cost on the top and estimated ultimate recoveries on the bottom. And the bottom line is well costs have gone down, recoveries have gone up, break evens have gone down. So one big open question is uh, as we give up costs, and as our, our kind of productivity gains start to level out, will there not be upward pressure on these break-even prices? Because at the end of the day, what really matters, to kind of to, to go to, to, go to uh, Greg's uh, point, is what really matters is what price do we need as an industry to, cre to attract enough capital that we can grow the business to meet global demand growth? That's the fundamental question.
right? And our bias at TPH, and I think it's probably consistent with what you hear on most of this panel, is that you know, at $50, even though the U.S. can grow and grow pretty nicely at $50 per these charts, it's actually really hard for the rest of the world. You saw it in RJ's slide. Where's the capital going? It's going here because you've got lower break-evens, and it's going less and less to big-ticket exploration in deep water and other parts of the world. That would lead you to think that over time you would have upward pressure, particularly as you give up cost gains, and that upward pressure on your break-even price will settle out somewhere higher and maybe meaningfully higher than we are today. Now, I will caveat all that by saying we've been saying that at TPH for two years, and we've been flat wrong, Ab absolutely wrong. And the truth of the matter is the growth has come from the Permian at rates and, and levels that have surprised all of us. Uh, and if you talk to some of the most active operators in the, in the basin, they feel like we can still double the rates of growth, uh, actually, just from the Permian Basin. So put aside the Bakken and put aside the Eagleford and put, us, put aside, uh, you know, the, the wet gas Utica. Just in the Permian, we could probably grow at a million barrels a, a, million barrels a year. Um, so that is kind of the big, you know, the big open question, if you will. So, you know, in the U.S., the energy industry works at $50 WTI and $250 Henry Hub. Returns aren't fantastic, but they're, they're okay. They're good enough to attract capital. We will continue to attract capital uh, here. The question is, at those levels, are returns good enough in other parts of the world to attract enough capital that those other parts of the world can contribute what's needed to grow production to ultimately meet uh, global, global demand? It's very clear that the biggest, most sophisticated companies around the world want more short cycle assets in their portfolio. The best place to get short cycle assets is, uh, is in the United States, and the best place in the United States is in the Permian Basin. And so things have gotten very expensive there, but capital will continue to flow there because capital uh, flows to, to, to the best rock uh, and, the, and the best return. So the, the, the long term question, uh, you know, per these comments uh, about what happens to global demand in 2030 or 2040, or 2050 is where do you sit on the cost curve? Because looking out, you know, 10 or 15 or, or, or 20 years, we can certainly imagine a period where oil demand rolls over and starts to go down. Maybe it goes down precipitously, maybe it goes down very slowly, but it almost certainly will start to go uh, down as transportation um, fuels switch. But uh, it's going to go down from a higher level than it is today. <laughs> so if we have 95 million dollars, 95 uh, uh, million barrels of, of, of demand today, will we start going down from 100 or from 115 or from 120 or from 125? It will start going down. But 125 million barrels is still a lot more than we have today. That's 30 million more barrels than we have today. So the question is going to be, uh, for your survival as an as a energy company, where do you sit on the cost curve? And one of the things you know is you want to be on the lower end of that cost curve. When demand starts to decline, you need to be on the lower end of the cost curve. And back to my earlier chart, you start looking around and say, where's the lower end of the cost curve? Well, you know, a lot of it is in the Permian Basin of West Texas and in unconventionals uh, in North America. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark Jason. So I get the task of following uh, CEOs of companies, the heads of service companies, an investment bank head, and what do lawyers bring to the table in this? It certainly isn't a discussion of legal topics. I think I would lose you all fairly quickly. I think in thinking about where oil is and where it's going, what the transition looks like, there's what's in the front of your head, which is a lot of the data that you've seen, and what's in the back of your head. What is this product? How is it used? In what way is it permanent or not permanent in different market sectors? So I thought I'd try to uh, run through a bit of what is in the back of most people's heads and certainly those in the industry when thinking about the product itself. So this is stuff you probably know. Some immediate products you get from refining, gasoline, distillates, jet fuel, petrochem feedstock, on and on. But oil is, is woven into your lives. I think most of you realize that. but in what you brought with you today, in what you wrote in, in the things you have at the house, and the things you have at your office, all of them are made from oil. I think one theme you'll hear in, in what I have to say is that there really is no product like it. I do a lot of gas work, I love natural gas, but there is no product like oil. It is absolutely woven into everything you do. 
So what is directly affected by the price of a barrel of oil? So anything you make from oil is obviously affected by it. Uh, any oil refined products, including gasoline and diesel, and the correlation to prices can change over time and refining capacity, and you could talk about how directly they're affected, but it's the major feedstock, so you're making things from it. Natural gas, you'll probably hear a bit more about this later on, which natural gas in many countries, the price is linked to the price of oil. And while that is probably changing, it's probably not going to change significantly in some places because there's no ready product to price against. Electricity, well obviously if you're generating through natural gas or you're generating through diesel or heavy fuel oil, then you have the price of electricity linked in some way or rising with the price of oil or falling with the price of oil. And then you have petrochemical products derived from oil. So when you get, when you refine it and you have a lot of inputs, this affects all these products absolutely directly. There's also measures like inflation uh, that, that are directly affected. So the price of goods directly affected by oil and energy broadly. And they make up actually inflation indexes where they subtract out energy and they subtract out oil and natural gas because it has such a large effect. The price of shipped goods, even if you look at something and you say, absolutely, this is not dealing with big oil. We have no oil in this product. Well, if Amazon brought it to you, you were dealing with big oil, right? That's how it got there. It was transported from another country or was transported a long ways to get to you. And the economies of several countries, and this was touched on by the, uh, by the previous speakers, some of the currencies are absolutely linked to oil. National budgets, we were talking about the break-even price for some economies on the price of oil. Trade balances are linked to it. And sovereign wealth funds and thus uh, a, a huge pool of capital is linked to it. But what else does the price of oil affect? And this is where it really gets interesting. So this has been alluded to, the foreign policy of most countries since World War II has had something to do with oil, the availability of oil and the price of oil. Exporters and importers are both affected equally. I thought there was a very interesting discussion earlier, I think Robert was talking about uh, the, in Asia, the, how the, the importers, now they're on the demand side. The U.S. has sort of left the demand picture and entered the supply picture, and Asia sits not alone, but certainly predominant in the demand picture, and how that affects their foreign policy. It affects the foreign direct investment in a number of countries. And this was the, the I think it was alluded to as the winners and losers of the changing in the price market. There are a number of countries that are absolutely dependent on oil. That is their main way to grow. That is their lift out of poverty. And that direct investment may or may not be coming anymore. So that begins you to think that the word transition should pop into your head when you think about something like that. And it's not about the oil companies, it's about people. Trade patterns and integration and one of the reasons that countries are more integrated than they have ever been is there are suppliers and there are, there's the demand markets where they're using it. We have cross-border pipelines. This is a, creates a global web of integration which is, uh, would not have developed absent oil and, and will continue. So the analyst view of the economy, you always hear a view on how the economy is doing based on the price of oil. Price of oil is up, the economy must be doing well. There's implicit in that some thinking that demand is rising and thus the price of oil is rising with it. Uh, that is certainly was built into a lot of the macroeconomic analysis that Greg was doing about how the price of oil can move and what drives it. But I think most importantly, never subtract people out of this, right? People's lives are affected by the price of oil very heavily. There are jobs, there are lots of high paying jobs, not just in this country, but in all countries who are involved in the oil and gas sector uh, that are tied to the price of oil. Household budgets here, summer vacations, the, ride, the SUV, guess what? The SUV is back. You look at the latest statistics and they're making more of them. They've made a huge resurgence. Why? The price of oil. There really is, I think the, the thought I want to leave in your head on this is there's no product like oil. So to talk about replacing oil, there's, there's no such thing. As a matter of fact, I can't imagine how long the political and economic transition would take if oil just disappeared. It would be a complete disruption to the global economy. So I think I just rule it out. When you put all the factors weighing behind it, you say, well, that's not going to happen. Well, then what do you mean by transition? What is a transition for such a product? Well, I think you heard some, some better analysis than I could offer about the segmentation 
right? There's a few places where it can transition. Power, right? And consumer automobiles. So these are places that I think in OECD countries, it pops into your head. So, okay, we're, well, France and the UK, and we're going to have electric vehicles, and we're going to have plug-in hybrids, and this is how you think of it. That's because you have a developed power grid, you have transmission, you have distribution, you have an ability to bring on board this kind of electric generation that could displace in consumer transport, potentially could displace oil or oil products, gasoline, diesel, things like that. That is not possible in every country, right? And it's certainly, if they don't get the investment they used to get, it will become less and less possible. But I think BP put I, th I just put the quote here because I think it's striking that we're basically going to double the fleet. I think uh, someone else said uh, we're, not, we're going to 2 billion, not 1.8 billion. So imagine the entire automobile fleet of the world today and its consumption, and it all went to electric. An entire fleet just like it will appear in the future. So no matter how rosy your assumptions are by the rate of replacement, you have to take into account two things. The world is likely going to have more automobiles. The growth will occur in countries that do not have massively developed electric grids. It's difficult in the United States to integrate the electric grid with the cars. It's going to cause a lot of transitions. It's certainly something we're doing, but it's hard. Imagine that in countries that are in the developing mindset where this demand is going to come from. And you begin to say, well, maybe even in the rosiest scenarios, you don't get the kind of growth in the percentage of electric vehicles of the global fleet. BP was saying 2035, you'd have 6% of the global fleet. And this is obviously, I think, what, a great point that was made, and I'll just follow up on it here. Heavy road transport, very, very different. I love the kilogram and the, and the, uh, and the power curve. I think that's absolutely the case. Ocean-going shipping fleet. What is a transition for heavy road or ocean-going shipping fleet? Well, I think liquefied natural gas has been proposed for that market. That may or may not transition in. It may compete with oil. Uh, it will certainly compete along the arbitrage if there's a large one. But whether that will transition in is a question. But it doesn't look like now, as technology is configured, that that's a great place for power. And I think you've got the airlines. That is a great point that was mentioned earlier. They, there doesn't appear to be something on the horizon to replace jet fuel as it currently stands. So there's a large number of markets where the transition is very, is very different. So you think of it in segments and try to, I, I put in here, to think about the developed versus developing nations, right? Try to step out of your OECD mind frame and think about the world writ large and the ability to develop and to distribute cars and liquid fuels so that people have you know, roads and transportation so much easier with a product like oil. Could be right, could be wrong, but my thinking is if it's way easier and the cost is moderated by supply, it is very likely that many nations will just continue down that path and maybe they'll have a transition somewhere in the future. But even with the, all of that happening, there are other markets that it's not clear what the transition will be. So, Demand, supply, price, what causes transitions? Well, I have an economics degree, not much of an economist, but I have an economics degree, and you would always hear price, 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 price. But the demand, supply, demand side has to do with choices in the countries, right? What do you want? What does China want its future transportation system to look like? What is their industrial policy? What do they want to produce? How fast do these economies grow? These are key questions. And the supply, wow, there's some excellent stuff on this panel on supply, so I, I, won't, I won't try to even match that. But some of the things that were mentioned, investment requirements in different countries, political risk. Uh, I think that, that Bobby said it best, capital focuses on the best rock and the best return. And built into best rock and best return, there's a big who question. Who? Who is going to get the investment? Where will it go? Which countries? Because you're seeing some countries already struggling. And it goes back to our first presentation, the keynote. There are a lot of countries that this is likely to cause dislocation and to cause disruption in their economies that is very different if the, if the, if the investment doesn't flow to those countries than here. And so those things all have a washout on supply. Whether the price moves or not, it's moving the production somewhere else and displacing and, and causing shocks to other economies. 
and you can't just think that that's not going to have any effect anywhere. So it's a very complicated story, but it's all built around the fact that there really isn't a product like oil. So I will, uh, I will sit down, we'll go into, I think, Q&A, and, &A, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. While I digest some of uh, the questions, I, I will uh, try to pressure you into violating Bobby's uh, uh, very prudent <laughs> rule of not uh, predicting the price of oil with a time frame. Um, so, but I mean, if if uh, if I can get you to sort of at least give you uh, give us an idea of how do you see price evolving, you know, next year, five years, ten years. Uh, I, I mean the way you think about it, and some of you already have you know, presented some of the ideas, but if, if you can, if I can convince you to do that, uh, to uh, risk yourself. I'll go first, since Bobby used me as an example. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the, um, you know, I think it's really hard to predict, you know, is the oil price going to be 55 you know, now like it is today? Will it be 65 next year or 70? The answer is, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So <clears throat> to me, it, it comes down to, you know, how do you plan your business? And I agree with Bobby, you know, uh, he or she who is lowest on the cost curve will win under any scenario. So certainly the way that we're planning our business is, uh, you know, we're planning our business to be long term $50. Um, do I believe it's going to be $50 forever? No. But given the uncertainty of timing and all those things, I think that's how you have to plan your business from a cash flow management and all those kind of things. So if it's higher, it's great. Um, but we're certainly planning on $50 long term. So, okay, thank you. Oh. I would add uh, that we would, we would expect a fair amount of volatility in, in the oil price in the next couple of years, primarily because very little capital in the last three years has gone into deep water exploration with deep water exploration uh, or deep water production, ultimately accounting for, you know, call it 10 to 12 million barrels globally. So think about that. That's as big as Russia or, or, you know, bigger than the United States. And when you have a period where you starve that business for capital, production is ultimately going to, going to decline. So we think there are likely to be price shocks associated with that. The question is, how long will those price shocks last and how quickly can the shorter cycle production then fill the gap? And, and this shorter cycle production has surprised us to the upside. So, uh, you know, the, the, the notion that we'll kind of somewhere hang between $45 and $55 or $60 uh, with some price shocks to the upside seems very sensible to, to me. But as, as Greg said, it's, it's very difficult to predict. I have a, a friend here in, in Houston, many of you would know, John Arnold, who is one of the great gas traders of, of all time and made billions of dollars trading natural gas. And I asked John uh, what he thought of oil. Uh, and he said, I have no clue uh, <laughs> uh, uh, about oil. It's just there, there's so many exogenous factors, geopolitical, you know, global technology, et cetera. It is, it is certainly a very, very difficult thing to predict. The good news is the industry has shown its ability to adapt and adapt relatively uh, quickly. There tends to be a lot of pain associated with that uh, uh, adaptation. Jean-Francois mentioned uh, the, the decrease in employment, for example, at, at Schlumberger. If you're on the wrong end of that, uh, that ad adaption, uh, adaptation doesn't feel very smooth. Um, but the industry has done it and is profitable uh, again. And my guess is if it had to adapt to lower prices still, uh, it would adapt to low prices still. Do you want to comment there? Well, I won't go uh, and talk about the price because I also have no clue, uh, <laughs> and, and nor do we as an organization. <clears throat> what I can say, though, <clears throat> and what may not be understood well enough, is to go back on the, the, the period we've gone through. So indeed, the organizations, our customers, have managed through the cycle. I can tell you that for two and a half years, we went out and actually lost money on every job, meaning we paid to go work. That's not sustainable, mm -hmm. right? And uh, nor should we be expected to operate that way. Um, and uh, so, you know, going forward, obviously the, the oil price has everything to do with it. But what we're doing internally in our organization, and I think I can speak for the rest of the service sector, is reinventing ourselves to be much, much more efficient and uh, really change the ways of working. And that is a, a phase we've entered through this <coughs> cycle, which I think is going to completely transform the way we conduct business in uh, the sector, not only in North America, but all over the world. You wanna? 
No, lawyers don't talk about price. <laughs> yeah. Except your prices. <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> we talk about those a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are a few questions on, uh, on the tight oil uh, shale that some of you have uh, talked about. And so uh, what is the role of, uh, of finance on, on, on the development of, of, of shale? I mean, what, how do you, what do you think about this idea that uh, you know, this is financially driven because of low interest rates and this idea that it might, uh, that might be a, a, a bubble? Uh, you know, how can we uh, get productivity to, to keep uh, in, you know, pace with the cyclical increase Increases in in cost. How much of it is sort of high grading uh, versus uh, uh, actually uh, productivity improvements? Um, uh, can can you elaborate on some of these issues? Maybe Bobby. I'd, I'd be happy to take a, a cut at that. Sort of the dirty little secret of the U.S. onshore shale uh, business is that it doesn't generate hardly any free cash flow. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've now been at it really since 2007. You know, pick a pick a time frame. So we're now a decade in. And um, I'm not sure if you would really point to a single company who is able to both grow their production meaningfully and generate free cash flow out of, out of their onshore shale business. You know, arguably Pioneer is, is there now or at least very close to it. Uh, but it kind of depends how much you, you feel like you want to grow. And the, the companies that are public are under a lot of pressure typically to grow. Uh, and, and that's what they get paid for. That's when their stock price goes up is when they grow their uh, production. And it's such a treadmill, if you will, in the, in the onshore shale business that it's just very, very difficult to do that without constantly attracting external capital to the business. Now, the good news is that external capital has been there and been available because returns have been uh, attracted. <coughs> But there are some signs of caution now around the financial markets in that regard. In 2016, $30 billion of fresh equity went into the U.S. upstream uh, business. This year, year to date, uh, that, that's public equity. This year, year to date, it's about a billion dollars of public equity. Uh, and, and people are concerned that the, the returns, in fact, have not been as good as advertised. And in $50 WTI, uh, they are skinny at best. So I think still big, big open issues around the ability of, of the sector to attract the amount of capital needed. That being said, if you're a capital provider, where would you rather send it? Would you rather send it to that or would you rather send it to a deep water exploration program where if you're lucky, you know, you get one out of four, right? And, and so that, that's the investment calculation people are making. Anyone? Else? Well, I think <clears throat> I'll agree with uh, I'll agree with Bobby. I think that you know we're in a transition in the financial markets and how they think about shale. Certainly, you know our investors and obviously we're publicly traded. Um, our investors are very interested in cash flow. You know, when's this thing going to generate cash flow? What's the break even? Are you going to spend within your means? You know, for example, on the Bakken, um, that whole conversation has shifted from one that was all about growth to all about free cash flow generation. So I think there is a transition there um, that's going on. How long will it last? Don't know. But there's definitely a different tone, tenor, and conversation. Um, we're in a, whereas before, it was a relatively free, free money kind of environment. Um, regarding your question about you know, the stickiness and, and uh, you know, of um, of whether uh, as costs go up, how much of that you know will, will be a give back? I can only look at, I can only speak about our performance, and it's a bit what uh, uh, Jean Francois was saying. We have been very focused on lean manufacturing and applying that to you know the well manufacturing process. So, you know, if I look back at 2011, 2010, our well costs were 11 and a half million dollars. If I look at where they are today, this is a Bakken 10,000 foot lateral. If I look at where they are today, they're four and a half million. They're three times more complicated than they were in 2011, meaning number of stages, profit loading, all that. So the complexity factor has gone up by a factor of three, yet the costs have gone down by 60%. And productivity has gone up 300%. <clears throat> and if you strip that away, and say how much of that was due to price concessions in the downturn, of that $7 million delta in well costs, only a million, about a million was due to price concessions. 
So all the rest of that, that other six million was purely efficiency, waste elimination, you know, technology improvements, all those things, and, and that's what Jean-Francois was talking about. Schlumberger is very focused on that as well. I think, so I, I, I don't think the give back, if you will, on the pricing side will be as big as maybe people think because not, a, you know, Schlumberger, all the companies have gotten much more efficient, Schlumberger much more efficient in how they deliver their services. So, you know, so they don't need as much price as they may have needed in the past, right? So... I don't know if you agree with that. Or disagree with that. <laughs> I think it's a bit more than a million. But yeah. Yeah. No, I, what, I, what I can say is that you know, as we look forward, and uh, there are a lot of projections on how much more we can grow on conventionals, and uh, maybe the boundaries, of, you know, where we can take it. A lot of the players, you know, say that uh, well, you know, uh, we need to bring you know double or triple the amount of sand, the number of truck drivers, etc., fluids, uh, water. And, um, you know, in our company, our thesis is, is that simply impossible, right? The, uh, the, our stakeholders would not allow us to do that the, in this country and much less in other countries. So the role that technology has to play is enormous here. And as, as Greg pointed out, it's really the players that reinvent themselves, you know, and really challenge the way they've been working, as, as Hest has done in the Bakken, that are going to win out. Because, uh, you know, throwing more uh, horsepower and more muscle at the, the problem is not going to solve it. No way. And you can't do that, by the way, in other countries, you know, the, where unconventionals are present. You just simply don't <coughs> have the infrastructure mm -hmm. to be able to scale up and throw as much uh, resources uh, as we have done in this country. Yeah, I think that's um, it's kind of the same point I would make there. When you talk about financing and you look at what's happened in the oil and gas business in the last 10 years onshore U.S., it is an entirely different animal for how the types of investors and the types of investments that are made. Some of them look like straight financing. Some of them look, look like an equity interest that acts like financing. Some of them it's like financing, but it can turn into an equity investment. There's an endless level of complexity that's entered the U.S. onshore market. And the U.S. onshore market is wildly different than the rest of the world. So the kind of capital you can raise to do U.S. onshore deals <coughs> is wildly different than your offshore deals. Different types of investors, different sources, different risk tolerances. Certainly the political stability of the U.S. and despite the fact that the, you're not dealing with a government, you're dealing with thousands and thousands of landowners who own the hydrocarbons in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Despite that level of complexity, you aren't dealing with a government. So there's different risk levels. And if you, anytime you talk about financing, you're always talking, you're dealing with, if you're, you've got banks, you've got the debt side, and you've got the equity capital markets. But on the pure finance side, they're always focused on the risk, and the risk profiles are hugely different. You know, there, there are two uh, overriding emotions in financial markets, fear and greed. <laughs> and, and in 2011 to, to 2014, to the end of 2014, we lived in the era of greed. Uh, and, and what I mean uh, by that is that the appetite of the debt markets in particular to fund cash flow negative onshore development was, was basically unlimited. And the, the kind of capital that ultimately got allocated to these companies and the projects uh, was was crazy, uh, frankly. Um, and guess what? Uh, prices dropped and things went south and there were a ton of bankruptcies and people had their positions wiped out and uh, people lost, investors lost their jobs and the high yield guys went out of business and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we have transitioned into a period of fear. Uh, the, the companies and the projects now are over equitized relative to historic uh, standards, uh, certainly. Cautious is, uh, the capital is, is much more cautious uh, generally. But if history teaches us anything, it's that uh, at some point we will be back in the cycle of greed uh, and things will change again and capital will become easier. It always happens and it will happen again. <laughs> yeah. There are a few questions on, on the other sort of areas of uh, conventionals. I mean, how much are the, how lo for how long the, are the offshore deep waters projects going to be uh, postponed? Uh, what about uh, extra heavy, uh, uh, you know, is the Arctic going to be ever developed? And so where do you see the other growth? Uh, many of you and RJ started uh, presenting the same and Greg uh, and others. Uh, see a, a wedge that needs to be filled uh, um, uh, above uh, 
uh, shales uh, about tide oil. So w what are the, the places where this is going to probably be happening? Yeah, I think maybe let me start first since we're kind of working in both camps, both unconventional and the offshore. Um, I think it's a bit what Bobby was talking about. I think, um, you know, investors have to first get comfortable again with that sector. Um, and that's going to be a function of price, obviously. But also, if you look at the cost curve in offshore, you know, we're, we're not at the bottom yet. Um, why is that? Um, if you look at the shipyards in Korea, for example, uh, last year or two, three years ago, they were 100% full. Uh, last year, they're 50% full. Next year, they're predicting that they might be empty, some of the big ones. So, you know, these are kind of major, um, major shifts in the cost structure of, of things like shipping. I can't give you the exact numbers because it's confidential, but the, uh, you know, we, we contracted, our partner Exxon, you know, contracted <coughs> deep water rigs to prosecute our offshore Guyana project that are unbelievable in terms of price. Um, <clears throat> we see kind of some of the ancillary services still, you know, still dropping a bit in price. So what that means is, is that here's a deep water development in offshore Guyana. And to be fair, it's, it's unique and it's got a great reservoir. It's relatively shallow below the mud line, no salt, uh, you know, those difficulties you have to deal with, say, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but it is deep water, you know, 8,000 feet of water. And it's got a break even now of $35 a barrel. Um, so will that compete? Is that competing with, you know, our investment inside Hess and the Bakken? Absolutely. Would it compete with the Permian? Absolutely. Now, how many more Guyanas are out there? I uh, don't know. There's probably quite a bit in the Guyana Suriname Basin yet to be discovered, which we're working on. Um, but I think even the Gulf of Mexico, you're seeing those, those break-evens come down. So I think it's more about, you know, signals of price going up Investors getting a little more confidence back in the sector for all the reasons Bobby said they lost confidence. Um, and I think that deep water is going to be the first cab off the rank, I call it. Um, you know, heavy oil, all those kind of things, I think those are further down. Um, you know, Mexico, I think, could feature. Um, it's kind of in the same fiscal regime almost as the Gulf of Mexico. So I think it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be the next one. And then Atlantic margin, just the entire Atlantic margin is really a new emerging province where there's a lot of, a lot of oil and gas. So that's why we're playing in that sector. Great. Anyone else want to comment? Uh, there are a few questions on, on technology and, and what, in, uh, both in, in, in tight oil and shale and, and in conventional, uh, what uh, major breakthroughs could uh, could happen? Uh, and, and in particular, some are asking about. Uh, you, you focus uh, uh, a lot of the. I mean, a lot of the discussion has focused on on the development in in tight oil. But uh, are those going to be trans translate also in reductions in cost uh, elsewhere, or some innovations that might be around? Maybe I can uh, <clears throat> start with that. The, um, if you look at the, the well construction cycle, there's really uh, the drilling side of the thing and the completion side, and those are separate. Going forward, there are a lot of improvements that have been made already on the drilling side of the, the, the equation, which is the time depth curve. Um, and a lot of players think, well, you know, we've kind of sorted that one out, and now we focus on completions. We firmly believe now that we're right at the, the step of a complete yet another step change of efficiency in the drilling process. And this is by through the complete integration of systems, and not discrete provision of elements in the, the well construction process, but a complete integration, which will allow us to start bringing in automation, uh, reducing a lot of the, the costs that we have uh, in the system, which are primarily human, uh, and uh, inefficiencies uh, within the equipment itself. So pro uh, systems now are being integrated um, in our company and also our, uh, our competitors, which I firmly believe will take us to the next level in construction <coughs> of the well. Now, on land, that's going to be quite material, but offshore, the size of the prize is enormous. You know, we firmly believe in our company that we can take the, the price of uh, deep water wells down 50% because there are huge inefficiencies associated with uh, the drilling rig itself, 
the, um, the blowout preventers, the maintenance processes, all of that can be greatly optimized. And when you couple that with a systems approach to working and the partnership with uh, customers, you know, versus the service company and then an oversight and an oversight and an oversight, um, that way of working has to, to be put to the side. So there's a huge element of uh, cost reduction that still remains in uh, the deep water. And uh, the slide I showed you with deep water coming in, you know, in the next five years or so to contribute more, um, that will be at a, a very interesting um, cost point. No, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, um, I think we're, you know, I don't like to talk innings. I mean, because people always ask me, well, what inning do you think we are in unconventionals? Um, and I always say, well, maybe, maybe we're the fourth or fifth inning of a nine inning game. Um, still a lot more on the efficiency side in the onshore. I think the, the you know, things that we haven't even talked about because of oil price <clears throat> are, you know, enhanced recovery in unconventionals. I mean, the oil industry has a track record of never being satisfied with single digit or maybe high double digit recoveries anywhere in the world. So this will come. Uh, you know, we're doing a whole bunch of proprietary work at the University of Wyoming on the Bakken formation um, that shows you can you can substantially improve recovery by doing a number of things. It requires a higher price, but you know that's a huge prize laying out there somewhere in the future. And then the other thing I agree with uh, Jean Francois about: we've taken a lot of the things that we've learned in the onshore, particularly about efficiency and things like that. <clears throat> um, you know, to the offshore. So deep water wells, forgetting about price concessions, take that out of the equation. You know, we're seeing uh, reductions in cost of, you know, 25 to 30% just on some of the efficiency things. Because very different than the onshore, you know, standby time for an offshore drilling rig with the spread rate and all that, call it a half a million dollars a day at current prices maybe. So if you have NPT of five hours a day sometimes think about how much that costs you um so you know we've we've made a lot of progress we've got a long ways to go i think the last big exciting area um certainly for us in the Bach, and i think it's just exploding as the industry is all the big data and analytics um i can use it Bach, and as a case in point um we basically have a a, a, a very large data set in the Bach, and because a lot of it's public so you have access to it. We participate in the majority of our competitors' wells. We have a giant database that runs on the cloud every night that gets updated with current information that's coming in from all, all of our systems, you know, public systems. Uh, we run the algorithms every night. And we can predict the performance of an individual Bakken well, being a, a competitor's well or our well, um, within a couple percent. So this notion of, you know, the Bach and oh, all these unconventional plays or statistical plays and all that kind of stuff, that's not true. Because you can prove with algorithms, that, you know, that you can, you can absolutely predict the performance of every well. It's not just a crapshoot. And certainly that was the, the conventional thinking of the industry about 10 years ago. Just drill a bunch of them and, you know, the bell curve will work and all in all would be good. Um, what the big data and analytics space has shown us is that that is absolutely very predictable. Oh, so. I would point out that, that all the things that Jean-Francois and Greg just talked about um, have to do with oil that is already found. <laughs> uh, it has to do with production, uh, really. And I think a, a big open question is what, what are the likely technological breakthroughs to improve likelihood of success mm -hmm. in finding new oil? And, and therein lies the, the <coughs> tough call for management teams and boards around where their capital goes. And the truth is, since, I, you know, people would argue with me a bit about this probably, but I would say since, since uh, the advent of 3D seismic technology, we really, as it regards a big ticket, uh, big scale um, exploration, we haven't had major technological breakthroughs that have absolutely changed that game in any meaningful way. And that technology is now 40 years old <coughs> or something like that. So, so I think one, one question would be, are we going to have step change improvements on the exploration side that is ultimately going to change the kind of balance of power, if you will, as it regards where the capital 
where the capital goes. Uh, because even with similar returns at similar oil prices on a risk adjusted basis, it's a very, very different business. If you look around the world and say how many sizable oil fields have been found in the last decade, in the last decade, how many sizable oil fields, what would be your number, Greg? Four? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, less than 10. Yeah, yeah. Less, less than, less than, less than 10. Less than 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny number. Mm -hmm. And think about the capital that has gone into that. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just mind-blowing the amount of capital that's effectively been flushed. Uh, so that, you know, that, that's an issue. And it's, it's a really big issue for the, for the industry. And we'll see, we'll see whether we can uh, attack it. I wish I had my uh, senior vice president of exploration here. Um, <laughs> Because um, you know the you know what I what we could show you is that there are there are a lot of technological breakthroughs coming in the seismic dimension, and, and again, it's all back to this computing power. Mm. Um, you can just do so many more things with cloud-based systems and all these things that you could never do before. And part of the reason uh, that seismic, in in some respects, was a little is slower was because it was so expensive to rerun that every time. So you made some assumptions and then you reran it a few times and, and you kind of had to go with it. That's not true anymore. I mean, we can run gigantic data sets overnight. That so used that's, to take that's great, to start finding some stuff. Yeah, we <laughs> no, I got two and a half billion barrels on the bank in Guyana, you, right? You found it, and that's one yeah. of the four. Yeah, that's the, right. In the last decade, so well done. <laughs> no, you're right, Bobby, but, um, but also, you know, there's things like, you know, uh, multi-azimuth seismic, that's a whole new technology that's emerging. BP's doing a whole lot of work on subsalt imaging in the Gulf that is lightening up and brightening up things. But, you know, I, I'm not going to disagree. There, there's a very different risk profile in those two dimensions, onshore versus offshore. So I, think I could add one thing to that and give you a little bit of a, a feel-good factor, right? Technology adoption in our industry, uh, we like to say, takes geologic time. So we are lagging in many, many aspects in terms of adoption and usage of technology. And the cloud has come upon us. And I can tell you one thing, the explorationists in our industry, which are quite numerous, spend well north of 50% of their time, actually much higher than that, uh, basically looking for data, trying to manipulate data uh, before they start using their MIPS you know, to analyze uh, potential targets, et cetera. Today, with the arrival of the cloud as a, as a platform and as a, as a software as a service, you're now able to basically analyze entire data sets, for example, the entire Gulf of Mexico on a, your own uh, desktop and be able to now use algorithms that are going to help pick uh, targets where, uh, and do a much better job than the human. Now, it's not going to replace the human, but I firmly believe that uh, our ability to identify targets now is going to go one quantum step because of this adoption of, um, mm -hmm. of the cloud as a vehicle. I believe that, too, and I think what these challenges, okay, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but it's that. coming. It's yeah. coming. Yeah. <laughs> the only principal point I would make behind all of that is when you find yourself with a well-funded market like oil and gas, you should probably always bet the over on technology because mm -hmm. innovation in a well-funded market always seems to outperform. So when you find yourself on the other side of that argument, tread carefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a couple of questions on how likely I is that unconventionals will be developed elsewhere, you know, Argentina, China, uh, other places. Anyone cares to comment? I'll, I'll take that one because we, uh, you know, we did have an international unconventional group uh, that was active for five or six years. Um, you know, looking, 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 uh, testing. Um, and at the end of the day, we came, we came down to the, just the, the fundamental you know, reasoning that, you know, there's five things that have to work in order for unconventionals to work. First of all, the, the rocks have got to be right. If the rocks aren't right, forget it. The U.S. has been blessed with some outstanding geology, and I could go into, you know, why that is and geologic deposition that is unique to, you know, many other parts of the world. The second big factor is it's got alignment of ownership interests, typically land versus minerals and all those kind of things. So everybody gets a piece of the pie is kind of what that means. The third thing is, is it's got all the infrastructure, be that, you know, pump trucks or pipelines or, you know, frac sand, all those kind of things. The other two factors that the U.S. has, it's got a good fiscal regime, 
and it's got a pretty reasonable regulatory regime on this. When you when you go out into other parts of the world, it's very rare to have all five of those factors line up. Um, usually, there's you can get three of them, but you can't get the other two. But it takes all five of those, you know, to kind of make it successful. And we found that in China, we found that in Australia, we found in you know in a lot of the places where we were trying to make unconventionals work that you were just missing all, all five of those success factors. They're all aligned in the US or, or North America, I should say. Um, Argentina, it's emerging, you know, yes, I think it has a chance. Um, infrastructure, what I hear is, is an issue there. Fiscal's always a concern, but, um, you know, uh, hopefully it, it will emerge as another one. So, but it, it's gonna take time, okay. so. Anyone? Uh, there are uh, a few questions on sort of the structure of the sector, sort of what is the future? I mean, in the downturn, and the service industries, uh, I mean, is there going to be, you know, more consolidation, how, the, uh, you know, how it's going to survive? Similarly, in, in, in other areas in this downturn, we haven't seen uh, that much uh, uh, consolidation compared to other, uh, other periods. And, and sort of what is sort of the future of the structure of the sector uh, in, 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 the, in the next decade or so? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the integration is an absolute must. The way uh, business is conducted in the oil field is really uh, segmented. And, uh, you know, any way you look at it, uh, that's not a good way to do business. It certainly has gotten us to where we are, but that's not going to get us to where we need to go. So um, our, our thesis is that you need to start integrating all the elements from uh, in the well construction process and the completion process. And, uh, you know, whether you call that consolidation or just a new way of working, that's going to be the, the new normal. And so that has been ongoing, uh, certainly in our portfolio, internal uh, reworks. Our competitors are trying to do the same thing. And, um, you know, we firmly believe that whether you're onshore or offshore, <coughs> uh, working much, much closer in collaboration and integration is the way to, to go forward. That, that's, all, that's the only way to unlock the efficiencies. Yeah, and it would be interesting to get Bobby's perspective on this as well. I think that, you know, the M&A portion in the upstream has been, you know, not much. Um, and I, I think the biggest reason for that is, is one word, it's deficits. Um, you know, mo the industry's largely been deficit spending, you know, through the downturn. Now, people's balance sheets are getting better and you know, all those kind of things. I think if you can, if, um, if, if, you know, the industry can repair itself, um, you know, balance sheets and financially, then I think you could see the M&A activity pick up. But, you know, if you've got a deficit, the person you're buying has got a deficit, your stock is, you know, in the tank, the, the, you know, it's just really hard, you know, to do an acquisition in that kind of, uh, that kind of environment. But interested in what Bobby thinks. Any, any self-respecting banker that doesn't believe there's not a wave of consolidation coming just wouldn't get out of bed in the morning, actually. So, <laughs> so we always believe there's a wave of consolidation coming. I would point out there, there's a very active asset M&A market uh, around the world, continues yeah. to be. Uh, it's particularly active here in the U.S. So assets do, in fact, change hands at, at very yeah. rapid rates. The role of private equity investment into the industry is a very, very uh, important one and will continue continue to be. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the unconventional game in the U.S. is that it was not led by the big oil companies, really. It was, it was led by men like George Mitchell and, and others, kind of tinkerers, mad scientists. Uh, the conventional wisdom among the big oil companies was uh, that the business wasn't scalable enough to, to matter to, to them. All of that has changed and changed dramatically. And so the big companies now do understand that there's enough of it. It's big enough to matter to them and they can make money doing it. And so that argues ultimately mm -hmm. for consolidation in the upstream sector uh, away from uh, the small smaller companies and, and to the larger companies. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see if, that, if that happens. You know, the, the services industry, of which Houston is obviously kind of the, the, the world capital by a, a long shot, has historically really lent itself to entrepreneurialism and to the kind of bubbling up of, of uh, companies and, and someone who comes up with a slightly better widget or, or, or simply provides better service than the big companies are able to provide. Etc. And I think I think 
my, my gut will, would be the nature of the services industry lends itself to that, and that will continue to be mm-hmm. uh, continue to be the case. Obviously, we have three or four big companies, of which Schlumberger is the largest, that have uh, industry leading positions. But the idea that 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 the smaller companies are just going to go away or cease to bubble up, I I would disagree with that. I think there will always be a role for uh, for that. Very often, they ultimately do get swallowed up, ultimately into kind of one of the big three. That's that's happened for a long time and will probably continue to happen. Great. You want to? Well, on the producer side, you've seen you don't have to sell the whole company. You don't have to buy the whole company. You sell off pieces. This is the asset market that Mm -hmm. Bobby was talking about, where companies in the downturn have taken their their dry powder, a lot of the positions that they haven't developed or they've only started to develop, and they've sold them off. So you sell off, you know, your position in the Bakken and you keep your position in the Eagleford or you acquire a position in the Permian. And it doesn't look like, you know, full-scale M&A where some company is just disappearing. Companies are changing their focus. They're more consolidated in one basin or another basin. Some companies have, you know, not gone into unconventionals. They've stayed with the deep water. So you've seen a bunch of different strategies that make it less likely that a company with a completely different profile would want to buy the other company. <laughs> they've, all their expertise, they've, they've done everything they could to become an unconventional mm-hmm. producer, and then the the idea of going and buying a deep water company seems something somehow kind of odd and would seem probably odd to the capital market. So it's been. I would also add that in a world of specialization, um, investors have followed that trend. Yeah, they have. And mm-hmm. investors actually don't want diversification. Investors have the view that if they want diversification, they can, they can create their own portfolio diversification by buying a Permian company, an Eagle Fern company, an African exploration company, an infrastructure company, and a services company. That That's the way they create their portfolio diversification. They want you as a management team to be good at what you are good at and not try to do other things. And so what, what you've seen in the, in the last decade or so is a wave towards specialization mm-hmm. uh, among upstream uh, producers. And we think we'll continue to see that and it's being driven by the capital providers. Mm-hmm. As you would imagine, there are a few questions on uh, what, uh, how would climate uh, policy, um, or carbon tax or other types of uh, uh, emissions policy affect the oil industry in the next uh, couple of decades? Well, I think, you know, so, you know, first of all, I mean, you know, the, the, the climate change issue is such a very complicated issue that's going to permeate all aspects of society. Um, and, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a balance of companies and host governments and citizens, frankly, all kind of working together. Um, you know, carbon tax, probably you mentioned that, um, you know, is, is one way to begin to attack the problem. I think politically, and it's been proven, that's very difficult. It's very difficult to do. So, you know, the solutions are, you know, it's going to kind of be an all of the above, you know, all of the above kind of solution. If we really want to tackle it, it's going to take a lot of various strategies. And yeah, I mentioned electric vehicles. Um, you know, the numbers I quoted, the 1.3 million barrels a day of, of demand impact, that's assuming that 150 million vehicles are electric by 2040 of the 2 billion, that's 10% of the fleet or 15% of the fleet. Um, that, that just shows you the magnitude of the challenge of how difficult, um, you know, some of, the, some of the transitions are that we are trying to make. Um, I'm not going to belabor this, but there's a really good study called the Princeton Wedges that talks about, you know, all of the various things that would have to occur to hold emissions flat by 2050. And these are gargantuan tasks, and you need eight eight of these things to work. Um, And so just the magnitude of the challenge is going to require you know, significant levels of regulatory cooperation, unprecedented, the world has never seen that level of cooperation. So I think it's, it's hard. That's you know? what I would add to that is policy clearly matters, mm-hmm. but economics really matters mm-hmm. and politics really matter, mm-hmm. right? So look, we could drive down vehicle emissions dramatically in the developed world really quickly 
uh, by slapping on a huge gasoline tax. Mm -hmm. Right. Because because guess what? When gas when gasoline costs four bucks, people use a lot less of it than they do when it costs two bucks. They just do. <laughs> and we've seen it in, in, in every cycle. I think one of the challenges we're getting to here is that in a period of, of rapidly evolving technology and relatively low oil price by historical standards, that, that, that has implications for relatively low gasoline prices. And relatively low gasoline prices has implications for relatively high gasoline usage. And so, you, you know, you, someone mentioned before that you, you see what's happened to SUV sales as gasoline has gone from $4 back to $2. Guess what? They've skyrocketed. When gasoline is cheap, uh, people, uh, p people use more of it. Uh, and so I, I think policy will re really matter. Politics will really matter, however. So the reason we don't go slap a huge gasoline tax on right. is the populace would go crazy. Right. And the politicians who did it would be voted out of office very quickly. Hmm. Uh, and, and so the balance here will be to find ways to, to drive down consumption uh, via policy that is politically acceptable. And, uh, and you know, that's a tricky thing to, to pull off. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you think about climate change and you think about car decarbonization, hydrocarbons are not ubiquitous. Obviously, some of them have a lot more carbon that is comes free in the process. I think you can look at what's happened with coal and natural gas and the uh, the reduction in CO2. Uh, you could look at it from economics of the production of gas has gotten cheaper and we found more gas. You could look at it as the attitude towards climate policy has been that we have a lot less, coal, lot less uh, carbon that comes into the atmosphere comes out of the ground and it's used um, with natural gas than coal. But I, I think Bobby's point is the right one going forward. As you start to get into uh, hydrocarbons where you've got a lot, you're going to cause a lot of CO2 emissions if you use them, you come to economic and social choices. And I think there'll be a basket of different choices made by different countries that are in different places on development curves. Um, obviously, your thoughts about it in the United States are very different than your thoughts about it in Venezuela. So, and I think that when you think about where the future demand is in Asia, uh, if you if you buy into that sort of theory of demand, which I happen to, then you have to say not what are our thoughts about it, but what are the thoughts of the people in Asia who are going to be consuming? What are their thoughts about it? Hi, yeah, Bobby. I just want to build on something you said. The um, in the first half of 2017, I just read this article last week. For every electric vehicle sold, there were 60 SUVs sold in the first half of 2017 in the U.S. In China, for every electric vehicle sold, there were 30 SUVs sold. And in Europe, for every electric vehicle, there were 25 SUVs sold. So it's exactly what Bobby's saying, right? It's all about consumer behavior and desires and what do they want and, and this inescapable fact that Liquid hydrocarbons is 60 times more powerful than than a, you know than the same kilogram of a battery, and that's no, a hard it, look, thing to if, get. If over. you're the Chinese premier and are not in fact duly elected <laughs> elected in a democratic process, <laughs> you have a lot more flexibility Absolutely. around applying really really dramatic you mm -hmm. know policy changes. And it, it's not at all inconceivable to me that they could do exactly what they're suggesting, right. uh, which is effectively outlaw internal combustion vehicles in the, in the relatively near term. It would take a massive, massive infrastructure investment to do that. I question whether they actually have the money to do that, even China, but they could. Yep. Uh, you know, I, could a U.S. president do that? Well, only if he wanted to be a one-termer, uh, I, <laughs> I would suggest. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. We, we are running out of time, but uh, I'm surprised there is no one question put, put mentioning OPEC in all the, all the pile. That tells you a lot about uh, how things have changed. Well, I, uh, uh, just real quickly on that. Yeah. Uh, if OPEC had not extended their cuts, oil price would be in the 30s, mm -hmm. would be our view, mm -hmm. okay. in the 30s. So lest we forget <laughs> how important OPEC continues to Continue be to in be. the overall balance of power Absolutely. in the industry. You know, we talk about the market resetting and it's rebalancing and inventories are going down. No. 
OPEC extended their cuts. That's yeah. actually that's actually good, what happened. Good yeah. reminder. And uh, but and there are only two questions, but I wanted to put them together on what is the effect of uh, the Trump administration's policies in their regulation and foreign policy in terms of Mexico and Iran on the oil industry. <laughs> Anyone care to comment? Bobby? I, I don't see major changes in behavior by by uh, U.S. producers from the last administration to this. I, I think th th there is uh, some relief, if you will, that that uh, red tape has been uh, reduced uh, and and that what they saw as, you know, overbearing regulation in, in some cases uh, has been reduced or at least not being enforced. Has it fundamentally changed behavior either from the capital providers or from uh, from from the producing companies, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I, I really, I think it's on the margins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, please join me in thanking our great speakers. Thank